My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. I was born in 1961. Uh, first 30 years of my life was entirely architecture. Um, next uh, 30 years is uh, mostly computer engineering, although I continued in architecture. Uh, I have uh, degrees in both architectural and, uh, and computing uh, fields and uh, work in number of universities and projects throughout the United States. So this um, lecture is uh, called Skeleton Beneath the Skin. It's in reference to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, mentioning of how uh, buildings are really a representation of uh, the skin of the building. The form of the building is a representation of the, of the skeleton beneath. And so uh, this is on the bones and barns of farmhouses. And Frank Lloyd Wright also was, uh, uh, grew up in farmland. Similar to where this project is, this is one of my projects, present home in Pennsylvania. Uh, so this is uh, an 1877 farmhouse and barn that I purchased. And... Uh, have been working on for quite a while. You see the barn in the foreground and then in the house with several uh, smaller additions of the past, not the main addition I'm doing, and then the garage on the left. And uh, it was farmland uh, zoned agricultural with corn on it. I traded uh, a local farmer to, uh, he could harvest the corn that was there when I purchased it if he seeded it with grass. Uh, this is in the Two foot stone foundation uh, plaster coating on the uh, in the basement. This is 1877, and this is approximately, or this was when Frank Lloyd Wright was about 10 years old. I put it into context. So this is uh, post and beam mortise and tenon construction. So the post is the vertical part, the beam is the horizontal part. Uh, the Mortise is the part that's going to stick into, or I mean, the tenon is the part that's going to stick into the mortise, and uh, and then you peg it. So this is uh, this construction is uh, is you know, 1877. We're going to look at in this old farmhouse, and it's uh, before any kind of power tools. And this kind of construction is still carried on today in large timber frames, uh, not in, in, in fast expedient construction, and is also uh, something you see in Japanese architecture quite a bit. This was my barn uh, before I worked on it. The first thing I did was make it into a porch and uh, uh, so we could use it. Um, you see some later structural supports there for lateral bracing, uh, sheer wall kind of things for uh, keeping the building up from lateral loads, wind loads, and just the general movement of the building. Those diagonal struts. You see that a little more there. High strength concrete anchor bolted in the ground, and these heavy timbers bolted. Uh, and then you can see up above there, new structure also holding everything up. A little more of that. Had to scribe that beam up above to fit the various beam sizes of uh, old dimensional lumber. that. You can see some of the wood saved. Here's a detail of that beam scribed and cut. All bolted together. There's another beam on the other side of the barn. Here's the main idea, capture these views. That's a 100-acre uh, uh, or 100-cow dairy farm. I'm not sure how many acres. It's over 100 acres in that direction. Good Mennonite friends. Uh, several hundred acres of Amish on all the other sides of, the, uh, of where we live. And so I'm capturing the views here, uh, a porch. See the view out the back, looking uh, Towards almost towards uh, Elizabethtown College, we'd be a little bit to the left in the view. The 
the second floor was a chicken coop. Uh, we're presently uh, renovating the second floor. We've got some new windows we're going to put up here. Now this is way back when, uh, before I ever built the brand new addition to the house. This is the original farmhouse you see on the right. Uh, all post and beam construction. And then an additional house they call summer house with a, a big uh, almost walk-in fireplace you can cook in. And then to the far left where you see those steps coming up. Uh, that was a shop actually originally. Uh, now it's a shop, my workshop for tools, uh, power tools. Um, Crosscut saw and table saw and miscellaneous hand tools. Um, <clears throat> it was actually an, the outhouse uh, attached back there off of what was a slaughterhouse for slaughtering animals, uh, butchering animals in the late 1800s. And then they bring it into the smoke kitchen where you see the chimney coming up, or the summer kitchen. Uh, but uh, I, I took the outhouse out, filled it in, sanitized it, filled it in with concrete, uh, built this these steps coming out the back that was the door to that uh was a, to where the steps go there was the back side of the uh the outhouse so what you see here is uh and spray painted on the ground is the uh, footprint of what i'm about to build uh but first i had built some models with some design choices uh, so this is design choice number three and you can see i uh, have uh, cutouts of the furniture and uh the people too um, my son, just a little boy at the time, my daughter hadn't been built yet or hadn't, hadn't been uh, born yet. Um, and so, uh, in other lectures I'll discuss, uh, you can find on my website, I discuss the details of various options of three different models and pluses and minuses. So we break ground. This is my son helping out, uh, we're breaking ground. We dug the entire foundation, approximately 60 cubic yards of dirt by hand with a shovel. It took half of a summer to do it. It was a labor of love, of course. Could have easily rented a backhoe and done it cheaper, but that's not the point. Um, my Amish neighbors thought I was a carpenter for the first bunch of years I was here. And I think they appreciate uh, doing things, not let's say the hard way, but uh, the hands-on way. So diggity dig dig, we're digging, digging, digging some more and more. You see the drain pipe coming off the roof there. Got to route the, all the water shedding off of the roof so it doesn't go in the trenches. You see boards now, those boards are called batter boards. Uh, you lay them out when you survey. Uh, I didn't use surveying equipment, but I use batter boards and levels, water levels, and uh, there's less than, uh, quarter inch of a variation, uh, actually it's a couple sixteenths of an inch actually of variation from one corner to the other, They're very level, and the foundation is very solid uh, based on previous experience I've had with buildings all over the United States, uh, primarily Pennsylvania, Texas, and California. Uh, this, so you see the trench here, you can see the dissimilar soils of clay and sand, had to do special foundation uh, design to compensate for that. You see these string lines going the batter boards. That's so you can accurately position the corners of your house with plumb lines, the corners of the foundation. Uh, so you can see now that that's actually the sewer pipe coming from the main house going out to the septic tank. You see the trenches there, the footings carved out uh, uh, precisely. Didn't need form work because of the hard clays, hard packed clay uh, at, at that level. Uh, left it uh, so they, we didn't cave in. Uh, batter boards, dimensions, uh, reinforcing steel. So uh, typically you don't see this in a lot of residential construction, but what I did was um, because of the dissimilar soils of clay and sand, I, I put a continuous uh, level of footing band all the way around of the footings for the foundation at a depth lower than the frost line in some cases because I made it continuous. I could have stepped it down and I also put steel in it too and this is to extra strength. So it's it's not over designed. I think this will keep it from settling and, uh, and the old farmhouse we're not hanging off of that at all. We're actually shoring that up 
Um, so in a way, this is not only holding up the new 1,500 square feet of building, but also holding up the uh, previous construction, approximately 1,500 square feet. Uh, the overall square footage of the barn and, and everything is so uh, like 5,000, 4,500 square feet. In the garage, basements. So you see the strings here, the uh, indicating where the concrete pour is going to uh, end. I'm using spray paint to designate areas and string lines. You see the steel, you want to put it up off the concrete. You don't want your reinforcing steel laying on the bottom of the foundation. It's a composite material. Uh, steel provides the tensile strength of the concrete and the compression strength. Uh, we'll talk more about that in our structural material methods classes and engineering courses. Um, but to, to have st structural steel or uh, reinforced concrete work, the structural steel needs to be placed uh, in, in a proper place, not at the very edge of the concrete. It needs to be embedded. Picture that. More of that. I'm just showing how deep this is. It's got to be below the frost line. Otherwise, the water, when it freezes in the winter, will, will make the... Um, will lift up the uh, foundation. Uh, so this is why you go below the frost line in the Northeast and why you find a lot of basements in colder climates because you're already digging down that far. In buildings in California and Texas, we just put things slab on grade. So there's no basements because you're not digging down. And why bother digging out a basement if you're not digging down? There's other historic reasons too for having basements, storing food in the older times of this country. Uh, these tarps are keeping the water out of the trenches and the, when the rains come, in addition to the gutters already uh, getting the water coming off the roof to not fill the trenches. So you can get an idea here of the trenches getting ready uh, for concrete pour and the batter boards uh, that we use to lay everything out and the tarp keeping the water out and this board going across to uh, allow us to walk back and forth across the two spaces on either side of the uh, trenches. So the only thing I subcontracted and didn't build by hand was uh, bringing in a concrete mix truck. It would have been a ridiculous number of bags of concrete I would have had to mix. And I couldn't have done it fast enough to have it uh, you know, all drying together. You want a continuous dry of all of your concrete. So you really need to bring in a concrete uh, uh, mix truck. Uh, the only other thing I contracted was the roof shingles. Uh, as, uh, semester, fall semester was about to begin, and I didn't want to be rushing and potentially falling off the steep pitch of the roof trying to get it done to uh, dry in the house at a certain time. So that's what you say when you, you want to get the building to a point where it's moisture uh, waterproof. Uh, this is also a little more structural work here. This is a, a pier or a, a, a pilaster. You're going to call it, it's it's referred to as a, a structural support. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as a pilaster. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting a spread footing down, and then you see a column, and this is holding up the main structure, the new building, as well as shoring up the old building. And you see the depth below the frost line. Uh, there's did, I did mix the bags here by hand, uh, concrete for the footing, and then made this structural uh, column support. Uh, this is in the existing house, just to give you an idea of uh, some of the structure and how it's held up there. You can see the size of that main girder coming off of the bricks, uh, sitting on the bricks. Uh, this is just a, a hand-hewn tree, it looks like. Um, it did go through the local sawmill, presumably. You can see bark on it a little bit. Uh, other systems uh, we put in the future, I've, uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about it here, but there's a, uh, I, I can mention a little bit, there's an old steam, um, steam heated system, an old boiler that's in the building. And originally there was no, it was just the fireplace heating the house. But then about 75 years ago, they put in a furnace and uh, uh, oil burning furnace and it was uh, large pipes with steam in it. Then they converted it to hot water loop. And so the existing radiators in the old house are that, and then I put in a separate subsystem or separate loop with PEX, which is plastic tubing, 
a separate circuit going into the new house, in addition to some electric 220 volt baseboards. Um, that's what you're seeing in the pipes here. But you know the structure we're talking about here, so you can see somebody had shored up in the past. I didn't put this beam in, shored up the, the girder in the middle. So you get the idea. I don't want to put any more load on this house, this old 150 year old house. Concrete block comes. Um, actually got the idea for the zero turning radius robots uh, that we had an international competition by the skid loaders that could just pull these uh, pallets of blocks off of a truck really quick and spin around in their own footprint. Uh, so zero turning radius. Uh, and uh, there's about 450 blocks, I believe. So you want to, you got to get that first course perfectly straight and plumb. You use these uh, blocks with a red string that uh, keep keep the lines of the, each course nice and level. Uh, so we did this block by block. Let's see how that looks. This is one of my favorite pictures of my son, a shadow cast of my son on the concrete black walls. We're building the house together. Now you see a little bit, a couple things in here. You see the black parge coating there and then an insulating uh, uh, rigid fiberboard, uh, keeping waterproofing and also uh, thermal uh, resistance of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the wall section, <clears throat> keeping the house warm. I did eventually dig out before, you don't see it here, but dug out everything, it's more dirt uh, in, uh, in, uh, in below the new building. You see the main girder coming cr across from the old house uh, with all, all those two by 12s uh, nailed together. <clears throat> That's uh, gonna be the spine of the building coming up above. Uh, carrying load, transferring it down. Uh, that uh, that pilaster uh, on a spread footing column that I showed in a previous slide is up against the house, uh, the old house, and then that's bearing one side of the beams load, and then the other is bearing on uh, uh, where you see the uh, the beam resting on the outer foundation wall. Where I did fill in with the blocks and concrete and put steel in those courses of block, so it transfers load right down to the foundation. You can see the gravel around the outside and a, a French drain. It's typically called agricultural tiles. You want to get water away from the foundation, so uh, have that with gravel and, and continuously sloping uh, down and then eventually away in a trench away from the building. Uh, you can see here my son laying one of the cornerstones. He carved his name in, into it, and he's helping lay the block. Joseph. You can see here the uh, bracing of the rigid insulation siding um, held up against the, uh, the foundation wall as we're pouring in the rocks. Uh, you can see the drain here. That yellow is uh, a clean out. Uh, probably never dig down to it, but that's just give access to into the French drain. It's a good to put a clean out on most pipes. Don't typically do with a French drain, but uh, I didn't think it would be a bad idea. You can run a snake down through. I, normally, you would never worry about cleaning out a French drain. Uh, sewers are a different story. And then you see my son putting gravel in. In this picture, you can see some of the dirt that we're still going to be digging out on the interior. You can see here the finishing of the foundation walls, and then uh, the, in the background there, the steps going up to uh, what used to be the outhouse uh, is now leading into the shop area. A little bit more structural work for the first floor. These floor joists are two by 12, size for uh, dynamic and static load of, uh, have a, a large, Piano, uh, larger than a, a baby grand, also uh, sized for people to walk around and not feel the vibrations. Another picture of the first floor structure. A little bit 
bit more of the first floor structure. A little more of that. I'll start putting the uh, tongue and groove uh, pressure treated plywood uh, decking. We actually used it as a deck for a little bit while it was in construction over one winter. Again, building this by hand, I am a full-time professor. I've got other things that you know, do too. So uh, <clears throat> I taught 38 different courses at the time of this uh, recording here. And so I'm pretty busy. And so mostly during the school year, I'm just doing this part-time in the summers is where I built most of this. So I guess it has taken a number of years and still working on it. I keep adding things uh, in the barn, other places, in the shop. In the yard. Um, so you, you may ask, why does it continue out? The, well, I didn't have the scaffolding at this time. I bought scaffolding later on, and I was just use, using this structure uh, to help with uh, access to the upper floor. So that's what that is. And I just saw that off later. Uh, built this little workbench for my compound miter saw and you see the views that I'm about to capture out the back there and some of the structure up above for the next floor up this is me so the second floor is going up you can see this is the summer house attaching to here Securing it with uh, bolts, lag bolts, and uh, some of the structure you can see there. Joist hangers. It's actually a structurally better way to attach them so they don't detach. Uh, here's some of the old and the new house together. You can see how that interface is going structurally. The old mortise and tenon construction, uh, balloon framing, where you a lot of the structure go out up the entire external skin of, of long beams rather than stud walls at each level. Uh, but the interface here you can see. Get an idea of the uh, old and new. Uh, it's not a trivial thing to make that seamless. So you're looking in back, you see my drafting table with the model on it in the back. That is the summer kitchen. There's a big walk-in fireplace right around to the left there. You can see the brick uh, for it. We still use that today. So some of the views that I'm going to be capturing, particularly this one. So, uh, you know, I had an idea where I wanted the windows and was looking at different windows and then uh, waiting until I had precisely the framing up. This is some of the luxury of being the architect, engineer, and builder, uh, and owner, uh, that I have the luxury of not specifying exactly where I want each particular window. Uh, and, I mean, as an architect, you would definitely have to do that ahead of time, but I had a luxury here of, uh, of doing a little more of thought. So, you know, let's, uh, let this sink in here of how that's going to be as a view. Lumber brought in, stacked up, ready for use. My son's project. Here's the spine uh, main girder carrying the load of the second floor. Another picture of the framing for the second floor. Then the second floor, uh, again, framing windows. Um, <clears throat> views, capture the view, going up with the construction, capturing views, capturing views, two stories up now. This picture shows some of the exterior sheathing a mixture of plywood and uh, rigid insulation, uh, plywood at key locations for structural lateral 
uh, stability of the building. Let's see the interface of the old and the new. You wanted to keep, I uh, kept the old house fully functional. You don't normally do this. You, I recommend moving the people out while you're building in addition to what, when, if you want to go fast. But this is my house, so I'm taking my time. Everybody's living on the inside of the old house, and I don't break through until I have to, because then there's a giant disturbance to the uh, family life inside. And I'm working from you know, before the sun rises often in the summer. <clears throat> and so uh, and there's dust and noise. Connecting the old and new. Preserve the old. Uh, you know, be a change agent, make things new, <clears throat> but preserve the best of the old. That's my motto. Uh, you can see the details here. I didn't use roof trusses. I like cutting my own solid uh, uh, roof uh, rafters. Going up. Framing the windows up above, framing the views. See a little bit of my drawing and calculations here. Uh, this is what you see in the bottom right hand corner is called a rake, where it makes for nice eaves, nice deep eaves on the gable ends. It looks much better that way than uh, people just use trusses and they end them right at the end. You know, right, right at the, that, that end is just a flush and uh, it's much nicer architectural detail if you have gable ends. Uh, um, that extend out of, uh, with a rake, the roof extends out the gable ends. So you can see some of my calculations for that. Not trivial. Uh, view from my roof as I'm building it. Uh, now this was not easy. My son wasn't was too young to help me here. So I'm carrying four by eight sheets up of plywood going up through the rafters, uh, hanging them over the edge. I still hadn't bought my scaffolding yet. Uh, seeing how long I could go without purchasing scaffolding. I, for the exterior uh, siding I eventually did. So I'm doing this all from above. And I didn't use, I have a compressor, I can use pneumatic tools, but I chose the hammer nails, many, many thousands of nails. <clears throat> I like to do things old school, uh, not because it's, e well, because it's hard, because it's hands-on, <clears throat> right? Don't do it because it's easy, do it because it's hard. JFK quote going to the moon. Why do we do it? Do it not because it's easy, because it's hard. <clears throat> now I would not do this for clients this way. This is my own. Well, you know, I would specify it this way. Uh, these kind of details and go much faster. Uh, the, the carpenters can certainly use their pneumatic tools. I wouldn't hold them back. But when I'm doing it myself, um, I like to put the time and thought into doing it as a hobby as well as a trade. It's not my main profession at the time while I'm doing this. I'm a professor this time. Now I had worked on carpentry crews in high school and had a couple small businesses and renovation businesses working through college estimating business uh, in Pennsylvania and Texas before I went and uh, uh, built large uh, office parks uh, coordinating all the design and construction in Texas and California for $100 million of high-tech office parks. So you see the roof rafters, roof rafters, and the uh, soffits out, extending out, the gable ends, building up. See the roof of the old summer kitchen to the right there. I left that intact, as I mentioned, to the end. Uh, you get an idea of the structure of transferring the load here. Again, this roof is designed for uh, tornado standards, uh, uh, much greater than we have in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> it could hold up in Texas or Midwest. In this picture, you can see the expression on my face of how I feel about working at heights. Uh, I'm okay with two, three stories. Uh, even doing carpentry work right near the edges, uh, not so much on high rises. Uh, if I'm near the edge of a construction project on a high rise, never felt comfortable doing that. Um, I'm okay in a helicopter, but uh, not standing near the edge of things. Let's see a ridge beam here. Some more roof rafters. 
roof rafters looking out the other way. Get a feel for how these uh, these, uh, these soffits and gable ends uh, are created, and the work that takes to do it that way. Not easy, but worth it, I think. Not expedient. This is not expedient fast fast food construction. This is old school craftsmanship. In this slide, you can get a feel for the look that I'm attempting here with the uh, details of the cornice work, the, uh, the soffits and gable ends uh, with some fine detail, all in wood, painted wood. You see some more details of uh, making these soffits extended out. A little more detail there. See uh, hurricane ties, those metal clips are to keep the roof from blowing off. Uh, give you an idea of uh, connecting the old and new, not a trivial thing to make that seamless and structurally sound. Uh, the wood for the fascia boards and uh, soffit, uh, these are the fascia boards up above that uh, part of the roof uh, gave uh, the, the roof uh, architectural details. Uh, painting them ahead of time before we put them up. Uh, we have two coats and then put another coat once they're up. And you see the fascia boards here uh, on the end of the gables and uh, running around uh, the soffits. And that detail is not trivial to make. All out of wood. Uh, because the vinyl siding just doesn't look the same, in my opinion, for this kind of work. So I did it all out of wood on purpose. And then I put a high-quality vinyl siding on the, on the side of the house. Plywood roof sheathing. Another picture of the plywood roofing. Chimney from the, this is for the furnace. See the new roofs. Looking from the other way, trying to make it a nice continuous plane of the, the shop in the foreground, then this next this summer house and the chimney, and then the new construction. This is the detached garage. I do see another little chimney there. That was in what was the slaughterhouse. It has actually two big cast iron uh, cooking areas. We haven't used that, but that's another additional cooking place if we wanted. Get an idea of the structure and distributing the load. The old versus new. You can see the details there in the chimney. This is actually steps up to a little attic that was above the summer house uh, first floor where the big walk-in fireplace is. And so you can see those old steps coming up there that I did take out. Uh, and this old attic space now being integrated into the new space. Uh, certainly not a trivial thing getting all this to work together. You can see my daughter's bassinet back there in the corner or in, inside the house. Uh, some more details of that. Get an idea of distributing the load. That big diagonal piece uh, uh, coming up is to hold the roof load so it's not pushing down on the, on the old construction as much. Building wrap, uh, moisture protection, thermal, part of the thermal protection. Some more of that. Then finally I buy the scaffolding, put up the high quality uh, Vinyl siding that's in uh, long 20-foot uh, lengths originally, so there's no horizontal seams. Uh, this is a very highly rated, high-quality vinyl. I'd rather not use plastics, but it, it's in some places it's appropriate, and if you can't really see that it's a plastic. Uh, and that's another reason I put all wood up on the cornice work and the gables ends and the soffits. Of course, we save materials. Uh, we're saving all these materials. Um, 
those yellow blocks my daughter wanted to paint some uh, it's just good good wood save all the wood repurpose it it's a green thing to do like Frank Lloyd Wright with his organic design it's a green thing to do before lead standards of today um, that everybody's doing now local materials Good use of the wood. See how it all stacked up in the background. My daughter with the project in the foreground. Here's my son making a table that he designed. Uh, Japanese influence, definitely some Japanese influence. You see uh, uh, redoing the drain field by hand for the septic system in the back there and some gardens up against the house. Uh, here's, here is the uh, <clears throat> table my son designed with our kitty little miss. Uh, here is the, uh, yeah, this is, you know, about 3,500 square foot house, about 1,500 new square foot. It's 4,000 man hours. I need to update that. That's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's more, certainly more than that now. Um, and it's a family project. And my daughter helped too. She wasn't born when we started it. It keeps going. Uh, some things to look at uh, now, come back and take a look at here, present-day timber frames. So we're talking about skeletons beneath the skin. And uh, frankly, Wright would often reference barns as some of his inspiration for uh, thinking of the skin of a building as, you know, and the skeleton simultaneously and defining the space within. Uh, he, he would often quote uh, like the tree leaves and the veins in the trees and uh, tree leaves, uh, and uh, you know, it's part of the skin of a building, uh, similar. So uh, you want to think about that in your architectural form and design as, and spaces, as well as your structural engineering. So take a look at these links. Come back, take a look at these, please. Uh, also, take the time uh, to look at uh, these uh, uh, links here, including uh, these videos on Japanese timber framing with an apprentice from Canada went and lived in uh, Japan uh, wasn't accepted at first but after many years is now a respected lead carpenter in Japan you'll see how they really appreciate wood there in a, in a, a almost spiritual way and then uh, a second video about the timber frame masters so please take a look at that